Cinema Classics is sponsored by WCBE 90.5 FM Columbus, Ohio, and is produced by John DeSanto. Listen to shows online at WCBE.org. I'm John DeSanto. And I'm KG Klein. And this is Cinema Classics. This is Cinema Classics, and today we're here to discuss one of the <laughs> most important movies of 2022. Oh boy, and one of the world-class greatest directors who ever lived. Maybe the best director of the 20th century. Yeah, and at least the Americans. At least for America, and especially if you grew up in the 1970s and the 1980s. Yeah, right. yeah. Uh, Steven Spielberg, who would have to go nose-to-nose -nose with Martin Scorsese and some others. George Lucas, uh, yeah. John Carpenter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, we could list them, but I think more people know Steven Spielberg as a director than anybody else. When you say the name Steven Spielberg, it can conjure up a variety of images depending on when you grew up um, and, and, and your background. If I say Steven Spielberg, you might think E.T. or dinosaurs, or you might think Indiana Jones, <laughs> or a, a car traveling through time. <laughs> yes. But you also might think about the ghettos of Krakow. Yes. Or the beaches of Normandy. Yeah, good, good. Uh, or AI. Or AI. I mean, Terrific This, this man goes anywhere. It, it, he is, he's described as the Peter Pan of directors. <laughs> he is the director who never grew up. <laughs> and he continues to know how to connect with our childhood and how to take us where we want to go and just lead us along merrily and give us a great ride. And therefore, we come to The Fablemans. We come to The Fablemans. Uh, a film that both of us enjoy. Uh, we're a bit concerned that there's not enough joy over this, uh, yet, it seems, in the theaters. Uh, for such an important film, for a film that I am sure we're going to see a lot of Oscar talk about, yeah. it, the movie is not doing well enough, and it should be doing a lot better. He had the same problem with West Side Story. Yeah, yes, yes. Great, great, so great right. movie, just not a lot of people went to see it. Yeah. All right, so... The Fablemans. Uh, give an idea what this thing is about. So this is a very personal film for Steven Spielberg. It's really his own fictionalized autobiography. It's the story of him from the time that he was eight years old up until about the, his senior year of high school. <laughs> I remember when his mother and dad take him for the first time to a movie. I think it was the greatest... <laughs> the Great Train Robbery. <laughs> a... a, 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 a not a great film in retrospect. If you ever catch this thing on late night TV, it is it is not the best movie. But for poor Spielberg, as an eight year old singer in the theater, he is mesmerized. But he's mesmerized not just by the the experience of seeing a movie. He's mesmerized by the climactic ending <laughs> with the train crash. <laughs> now, Ken, are we sure it's not the greatest show on earth or something like that? Rather than the you're, train I think you're right. I think it's the greatest show. Good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. And, and which includes a uh, a, a model train yeah. crash. A model train crash <laughs> into a car. Uh, to us today, familiar with CGI and the best, this is going to look very, very primitive. It looks like a model train crashing into a car. Uh, but to young Steven Spielberg, it was something that traumatized him. You know, it, it, Spielberg is so good as a director. He just let sets his camera on the, the kid's eyes as he's watching the movie. And as he gets to that point, as they begin to open, and he is just astonished. You're swept <laughs> into the experience that he's having. Yes, <laughs> yeah. And he goes home and he replicates it. He goes home, <laughs> and the only way he can deal with this trauma is to replicate it with his own train set, with his own little 8mm camera. And his mom brilliantly played. Oh, by Michelle Williams. Michelle right. Williams, absolutely wow. terrific. All right, so she tells him that he needs to take his dad's camera and photograph that so that he can watch it again and again without wrecking trains every time he wants to recreate. So that he can take control of this traumatic experience and he can own this experience yes. and in that way overcome the trauma. And 
if you're looking to see the seeds of his greatness, it's there. And I have to say, Mom just intrigues me. She's so eccentric. Well, Mom is really the central character of the story. And if you hear Spielberg talk about his relationship with his own parents, his father was an engineer. His father was a brilliant engineer and one of the inventors of the computer mainframe. And, uh, but a very analytical person. Yes. And his mother was an artist. She yes. learned to play classical piano when she was five. She studied at Cincinnati. Uh, she was a concert pre a pianist. Um, she had the artistic Until struggle. she had kids. Until she got married. Yeah. Until she got married in 1945. And then she quit the conservatory. Um, and she began raising kids. Yeah. And Dad... Played as well by Paul Dane. One of my favorite actors. Oh, wow, did he do well on this. Anyway, he's just a little bit preoccupied, as Stephen will become with his movies. He's a little pro uh, preoccupied with his engineering and his computers and so on to miss the fact that his wife is falling in love with his best friend. To miss this completely. Yes, he yeah. does. Her, and his best friend is played by... <laughs> oh, my gosh, Seth Rogen. Seth Rogen. You have to look for a few minutes to figure out, who is this guy? It is not your typical Seth Rogen part. This is not the 40-year-old virgin or knocked up. This is, <laughs> this is Seth Rogen as a mature adult oh. who is just the life of the party for this family and who this artistic mother can't help but be drawn to because her father is so intent on spending, or his, uh, uh, Sammy's father is so intent on spending time talking about his computer mainframes. Yes. Now, uh, Ken, one of the parts of the film that I, I liked very much was how Spielberg dealt with showing the cliches of high school experiences <laughs> for a little dweeby Stephen. Well, the, the film is really divided into three acts. Uh, the first act is Stephen as an eight-year-old. The, the early days, his very first experiences working with a camera. The second act of the film is him as a, uh, let's say, 12 to about 15-year-old. And then the third act is his high school experiences. And the, the film takes an abrupt turn when it gets to the high school years because suddenly he's a bit more mature and he's dealing with much more mature themes and he's also having to deal with the mature issues of what's going on within his family. Yes, and in, in that high school that so impressed me, the anti-Semitism was yes. rampant and he, it felt like he, he, not even his sisters were there, it felt like it was only he that was the object. In but reality, really, he was one of a few Jewish kids in his high school. It was Saratoga High School in Saratoga, California. Um, still exists today. Uh, and he was one of a handful. And his schoolmates recall that he was bullied a little bit in high school. Um, he may have played it up a little well, bit. Well, this is Hollywood. I this is Hollywood. Sure. And, this is, and it is a fictional telling of Spielberg's life, not a documentary. Right. Yes, yes. And, and that, to me, is, again, the beauty of it. He take, he's so personally associated with this stuff, but he can still yet be a director who stands outside of himself and portrays in a, a very affectionate portrayal. Um, I, I think this young man... Uh, he, Sammy. Yeah, Sammy. I think he reminds me, the actor reminds me uh, so a, a little bit of a Dustin Hoffman. In some ways, yes. You know, but, but he's, he's diminutive, but mm -hmm. handsome, uh, and you, 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 you've got to adore when he goes into the bedroom of that, that girlfriend. Oh they, my goodness! They praise Jesus. <laughs> oh, so he has. He ends up getting a girlfriend who is a very devout Christian, and she has decided to take it upon herself to convert him. Uh, and her bedroom is one of the highlights of the movie. Yes. Uh, the funniest moment of the movie is certainly when he walks into the bedroom, into her bedroom, and they're both high school students, and she. Her bedroom is decorated in just the, well, I'm not going to go into details. You really should see yes, it. Yes, right. Yes, you see it. It is funny. Um, now, I think one of the problems, there's a problem, and I'm thinking of marketing this film, is that it does become dark. It, that is, if people are looking for an E.T. kind of joy, it's, it's just, it's just it, as, he, as he gets older, Life gets very complicated. Well, Stephen, Stephen says in interviews that as the pandemic was going on, he slowed down a bit and he asked himself, what movie that I have not made would I most like to make be in my life? And he realized it was the story of himself. And he had, this was not his idea. He was put up to this idea about 20 years ago while filming the movie Munich. Uh, he co-wrote this movie with Tony Kirshner, who is very well known to the theater community because he's the author of 
Angels in America. And he helped him with West Side Story. He helped with West Side Story. He helped with Munich. Yes. Um, he's been a co-writer for Stephen several times, and Stephen and he have a very good relationship. Um, and uh, he, when Stephen told his life story to Tony, Tony said, "Oh, at some point you've got to put this on film." Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And he does it, and he does, and he does it well. Uh, in the in the end, what would you recommend, Ken, to our audience concerning the Fablemans? I would recommend the movie, but I would recommend it, and I recommend it very strongly. I think this is going to be a major Oscar contender. But I would also recommend going into the movie not expecting to see Jurassic Park or Raiders of the Lost Ark. Mm -hmm. Go into this movie expecting it to be a very personal experience about a family experiencing love and depression and betrayal and hope. Yes, and if you think that this is, uh, um, that we are really at holiday time where families are getting together, take a look at an extremely eccentric family and take a look at the seeds of his genius yeah. growing with a family that's so diverse and so whacked in some ways, uh, but and a family where the anchors are really the, the, his sisters. Yes, you know, the sisters don't get a lot of time on no. screen, but they do play an important role, and that role is, and, and Stephen also sent the script to them before starting filming so that he could get input from them to make sure that their voices were properly heard in the film as well. All right, Ken, it's the fable.